Well, hopefully. Hey, welcome back. It's Life and Death and Dirt. Um, we've been gone for about five months. I'm Rosie, your host. I'm a nurse. I'm I've got a lot of opinions. I'm very angry, but I also have a lot of information and a lot of love to give. Took five months off, uh, to be honest, because I was experiencing the most severe mental health crisis I have ever experienced. And I'm a veteran. Like, I'm not new to that, but it was quite scary. Not for me, because I didn't care if I lived or died. But it was very scary for the people who love me. Um, and I'm not totally out of the woods, but feeling better. So thanks for sticking around and welcome back. DJ also has a lot of stuff going on, working on some really, really huge projects. Uh, the most visible of which is that apparently he is collecting billions of farm animals to become a proper um, sanctuary. So uh, DJ's not here today, but I have a very special guest with us today. A lot of you probably recognize this person. We have Bobby, and Bobby and I met because we um, joined an online cult during COVID and, and became friends from there. <laughs> so Bobby... Welcome. It's great to have you. Hi. Thank you. I'm actually excited and intrigued. Uh, your message talking about CPR had me um, had me thinking about it. So I'm, about I'm interested to hear what you had to say. So. I have a lot to say, and I'm glad that you're intrigued. That's the right word. Um, today's episode. Okay. It's been five months. Sorry. And we're just <laughs> jumping right in. Okay. Today's episode. Don't be sorry. That was perfect, Bobby, is I want to talk to you about the realities of CPR, because everything you've seen on TV is fake. And anybody who knows me or has listened to my podcast before knows that I hate media. I hate news media. I hate TV and movies because they lie about so many things all the time. And most people, the only CPR they've seen is on TV. And miraculously, everybody who gets CPR on TV tends to do really well with it. And that is not the case in real life. So, yes, Bobby, I said, would you like to be on an episode where I terrify you and horrify you about CPR? And Bobby said, I'd love to. That's great. Yeah. So welcome. Bobby, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the things that you've been working on? Because you are a very busy person. Yeah, so um, I'm uh, I'm a trans person. Uh, I'm also a computer engineer. Uh, I'm a roboticist. I work with robotic systems. Uh, I design stuff for the Navy. Um, what else is important? Uh, I don't know. I like to make art. I do art. Um, you can see art. Um, art's a big part of my life, so is music. Uh, and... Um, I don't know. I just like helping people. So, and uh, that's a big focus of my life. So I'm glad to be here. Uh, I am friends with DJ. Um, I haven't made it to see all the farm animal editions yet, but I'm uh, hopeful I get to see him soon. And because uh, I've had some medical um, family stuff also. So, um, but yeah, uh, TV does not portray uh, medical drama. Um, my, my first child spent time and my second, my, old, uh, spent time in the NICU. And, uh, so I can't stand watching television, medical drama. Like yeah. there's nothing worse. Like that all occurred when was ER was yep. like the most popular show on TV. And people, are you watching that? I'm like, I can't watch that. I spent weeks in a hospital. <laughs> I never want to see it again. Nothing like a constant reminder of, um, you know, and then how far it is from the reality. Because uh, usually they swoop in and save the day and everything was fine. You know, they always know right what to do and they never make a mistake. So, um, but yeah, uh, after you asked me, um, it, it's, I've thought a bunch about CPR. I've had uh, so in Canada, I spent time at a summer camp in Canada. So I have my bronze medallion, which is basically like advanced uh, life saving. Um, I've also taken a bunch of other like uh, wilderness uh, first aid type classes. And uh, so um, I've been taught 
CPR many times, and I swear no two times I go, is it the same? It's like, you know, we do rescue breaths. We don't do rescue breaths. We do chest compressions, do it at this pace. We don't do them that way anymore. We do something different. I find it, I find it very interesting that, you know, I, I guess hopefully they're evolving and they're understanding better what works and maybe the early earlier stuff that I learned in the 80s was like, um, cause I am old, I'm in my fifties. And, uh, um, when I You're first learned, started, baby. yeah, I know. But when I first learned it was different and we, we got, we all had to do it in high school. We all had to go. And was it Resusa Annie that like doll? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then somehow she reappears, but she always looks very different every now it's like a computer and, They also make you learn on like an infant and stuff. Oh. And so it's just, uh, that stuff's fascinating to me as a computer person, as a roboticist, you know, that they do it, but it is very, a lot of it seems very primitive, just some pressure sensors and making sure you don't crush the the lungs or the, the ribs. I have broken ribs in the past, so mm -hmm. that hurts. I can't, I'm not, I can't. Oh, you've, you know. you've had a broken rib yourself. I have broken ribs mountain yeah, biking. Okay. So I've okay. cracked three ribs before. And uh, yeah, it makes your life very uncomfortable for quite some time. I believe so. you. Yeah, I believe you. And so it sounds like you have a lot of history of learning um, different CPR and first aid. Have you ever performed CPR on a person? No, okay. the, um, no. And I hope you um, never have to. Um, I don't know if anybody listening has. I also hope you never have to. You look like you wanted to say something, Bobby. Oh, I was going to say when I was a kid, I took, I got certified in scuba. Mm -hmm. And our instructor was a Navy dive instructor, which is actually where I work, where the Navy dive school is now. But um, they made us swim a mile towing a person giving mouth to mouth the whole time like yeah. that that was for a 12 13 year old kid that was a lot like but you may have to do this he he over prepared us it was good i mean yeah wow still, swimming a mile diving. period is extremely difficult but towing well at least we had fins and like a and a buoyancy compensator so it made it a little easier but yeah trying oh. like protect like two boys at the time you know like two kids just trying to to act like we're doing mouth to mouth and swimming yeah it was a lot but yikes um, wow fortunately okay. i've never had to do anything like that okay but so i want to talk to everybody about cpr um i'm gonna say a trigger warning for moving forward because the realities of cpr unfortunately are very brutal and very grim and so if there's anybody listening who knows a person who's had CPR, um, most of which are probably no longer with us, uh, this could be some shocking and difficult information to hear about the realities of CPR. Because like I mentioned before, I have so much rage towards TV and movies because they do CPR all the time because it's really exciting and it, it creates emotion in the, in the movie. Um, but they don't show us the realities of, of what it's actually like. And what I heard from a very, very wonderful palliative doctor who I learned from several years ago, she said, sometimes when she's explaining CPR to a patient, she says, you know who does great with CPR? Actors on TV, because they're not actually getting real CPR and their heart did not actually stop. <clears throat> so the realities are grim and brutal, but if you're prepared to hear that, I think it's really important for people to hear. Uh, because unfortunately, if you've spoken with anybody from the medical community who's done CPR, we all agree that we are doing CPR on people that we should not be doing CPR on. And it gets to a point where we are just brutalizing people and then right before they die. Um, so it's unfortunate, but I think it's infor important information. So trigger warning. Are you ready, Bobby? I am ready. I'm intrigued. <laughs> okay. I have a, I have a morbid <laughs> sense of curiosity. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> so what I want to say before I get started explaining CPR is that I am a hospice nurse. 
in hospice, we try not to do CPR. It is a person's choice whether or not they still want to be um, what we call a full code, which means, yep, if my heart stops or my lung stops, I want you to do everything you can to try to keep me alive. Um, but uh, most of the people who I work with at this point in my career are, have chosen to be a DNR, which is when somebody chooses do not resuscitate, which means if my heart or my lungs stop, let me die, do not perform CPR. So that's what I do now. I started my career as a nurse in the ER and I have done CPR multiple times. One time I was the first person on the chest. So I've done CPR multiple times, but it had already been started by someone else, like paramedics in the field or one of my coworkers had started it. And then um, we all come in to join in to help. But there was one time when I was the person who started CPR. Okay. So I'm telling you real life experience. And um, I'll get more into that there. I would like to never do it again, to be honest, um, if I don't have to. So CPR stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So cardio is our heart, pulmonary is our lungs. Resuscitation means to restart. So CPR is a uh, procedure that we can perform on somebody if their heart stops or go, maybe doesn't necessarily stop, but goes into what we call a fatal arrhythmia, a fatal um, pattern, or their lungs stop, so they stop breathing. But most of the time, it's both. Because if your heart stops beating, your lungs stop, your entire body is, is not working. You can stop breathing and still have a heartbeat for a short amount of time. Um, but typically, if somebody uh, experiences cardiac arrest, meaning their heart has stopped or stopped beating effectively, uh, they stop breathing immediately. So uh, the reason I'm focusing on that is because sometimes people, when they're making choices about, okay, do I want CPR or not? They might say, well, yes, I do want CPR if my heart stops, but I don't want to be put on a breathing machine. Don't intubate me. And a lot of people don't understand that if your heart stops, you are getting tubed immediately. Like if you're, if we are doing CPR to try to pump your heart and we're in a place where we have the supplies to intubate, the tube is going down your throat immediately. It It's not like on TV where you can just do chest compressions for 45 is they, minutes. Is that where they breathe for you also? Yes. yes. Yeah. So to be intubated um, is where they put a tube into your lungs and then breathe for you. So either you're squeezing, which is the, the motion you just did, Bobby, uh, what's called an ambu bag. Okay, so that's breathing for you. Or you get hooked up to a ventilator if, if there's one available. So cardiac arrest means the heart has stopped. Respiratory arrest means the lungs have stopped. Most often those happen together, okay? questions so far i'm just so, getting started <laughs> actually now that uh you did uh so um i i should have i misspoke actually my mom has had cpr performed on her but it was more of a crash cart thing but i didn't watch so oh, she okay. when i was 15 she uh she was on chemotherapy for breast cancer and she's allergic to methotrexate they didn't know that mm -hmm. they administered and it stopped her heart. And my sister and I were sitting in the room and they came rushing in because her heart had stopped and they, they threw us in the hallway and like a bunch of people ran in and uh, start got her going again. And I had forgotten about that until just now. Okay. <laughs> Not that I had forgotten, forgotten. Cause I, I recently was talking to her about it, but I, it didn't even like when you were asking me before the show, if I knew anyone and that one just out of my head. Okay. Like, uh, but yeah, so it's, um, but she's still here. So I guess wow. I do know someone who survived and uh, I know two, two people who've survived uh, who've had CPR. So, okay. But uh, wow. That's intense. Yeah, I totally so, forgot. That's okay. I can understand why you would forget that. You know, yeah. 
Um, right. So Bobby's bringing that up because be before we started recording, I said, do you know anybody that's had CPR? And I was kind of checking just because this is such a sensitive topic to talk about. And um, it could be very triggering if you've known somebody who's had CPR or who had CPR and, and did not survive. Yeah. So um, I'm glad that your mom had a great outcome. It's very rare that people do have a good outcome from CPR. And we'll get into that more. Yeah. I um, think it was more the drugs they administered. What is it? Epinephrine, I think. Mm -hmm, probably. Like to get like, and yeah, that's, I think that's what did it. Not the, not the compressions and stuff. So just compressions, um, yeah. probably, or a combination, but, but yeah. Okay. I'm getting ahead of myself in my head. Sorry. sorry. Um, sorry. No, that's okay. I, that's I'm real life you. example. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. So CPR is performed on people whose heart has stopped or their lungs have stopped. Like I said, usually those two things stop together. A lot of people don't realize that because of movies and TV or because nobody has explained it to them. Um, so the first part of CPR, if somebody's heart has stopped beating and we're going to perform chest compressions on that person, that's like when you see like on the movies or if you've seen it in real life, unfortunately, um, that somebody gets on top of the person and is trying to beat that person's heart from the outside. That is ultimately what chest compressions are about in CPR. And um, if we think about our human anatomy, our skeleton is developed and designed to keep our heart safe and protected. So our heart is in between our sternum, which is our breastbone, our ribs, oh. and our spine. And it's like that on purpose because that's a nice, safe place for it to be. So if you are purposefully trying to press hard enough that you're beating somebody's heart through their skeleton, you have to use a lot more strength than you've ever seen an actor on TV actually use. And unfortunately, in order to do what are considered effective chest compressions, you have to break ribs, period. If you don't break a person's ribs, either they are very, very young and still have really flexible bones, or you are not doing chest compressions well enough. Yeah. And you mentioned you've had broken ribs, Bobby. Um, yeah, I cracked three ribs. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> like, I'd tense. be like, you should have let me die. Because it hurts to breathe. You can't roll over. You can't move. It's right. And it takes weeks before that goes away uh, yeah. or more. And wow. So when you did when you did CPR in the ER and you took over for someone, are you just like pushing on like crumbly, like cr broken ribs? Like, can you feel that? Um, okay, so trigger or are you not even thinking about that? Um, hmm? Trigger warning for everybody, because I'm going to answer you honestly. And the answer is that sometimes, yes. So uh -huh. typically, okay, everybody get ready. <laughs> So like I said, there's only one time in my career where I was the first person on the chest. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but there are multiple times where CPR had already been started or CPR in progress, and then we come and take over. So if CPR has already been started by people in the medical field, they usually are doing chest compressions strong enough or deep enough that they have already broken the person's ribs in the first few yeah. compressions. So when you take over... Um, sometimes you can kind of sense that there's some bone movement, but a lot of times it's already been done. Oh. And so you're, you're just trying to beat the heart from the outside. Um, I will say that in the person who I was the first person on the chest, um, and this person did not survive and it was in an ER setting. Uh, but I was the first person on the chest. The first two compressions I did, I could tell. I was doing um, good chest compressions all day. Like I, I could tell what I did to this person's body. Now, um, yeah, yeah. So it is not like on TV and um, I'm not worried. So, mm, I care about the trauma that healthcare workers experience in performing these procedures. But what I want to focus on here is making sure people understand so they can make their own decision about if they would want this done to them or not. 
Um, and it's okay to change your mind. It's okay to be at some point in your life and say, well, yeah, no, I would still want you to try to do CPR on me if, if my heart or my lungs stop. Um, and then if things change or you get older or you get sick, it's okay to say, okay, I changed my mind. I don't want that anymore. Um, as you, as a uh, patients, we have the right to change our mind and refuse anything we don't want. So just remember that. So CPR. Yeah. If the heart is not beating, we are beating it from the outside of your body. Um, which is quite brutal. And there have been times when I've been discussing um, CPR with people when they're thinking about deciding whether or not they want CPR or want to be a DNR of some sort. And if it's if it's the right vibe that I'm picking up, I might sometimes tell people, okay, if your heart stopped right now and you wanted me to perform CPR on you, this is what it would actually look like. Not Grey's Anatomy, which is the worst fucking show that's ever been produced, okay? <laughs> I hate that show um, for many reasons. If your heart actually <laughs> stopped, and you needed, yeah, they cheers to that, um, and you needed CPR, I would get on top of you and I would use all of my upper body weight to crush your heart in between your sternum and your vertebrae. That is a chest compression that's effective. And a lot of times people go, oh, I don't want that, okay? But that's the first time they've heard the reality of what a chest compression actually is. Um, just for the record, I may be smiling here, but it's all just awkward. Like. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I know. This it's is okay. Like, no, it's just yeah. like, I feel like I'm smiling through this and I'm just like, I don't know what else to do. So. That's okay. Yeah. You can, yeah. you can smile. You can be horrified. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. Yeah. It's, it's brutal. Right. Um, now I mentioned earlier that uh, cardiac arrest, which is when your heart stops, and respiratory arrest, which is when you stop breathing, typically go hand in hand. So if somebody's heart stops beating or is doing what we call a fatal arrhythmia, which means it's beating, but it's not doing its job, it's not circulating uh, blood, we do chest compressions and your respiratory, uh, your breathing will, will stop if your heart's not beating. And so that's when usually, uh, immediately if it's available an ambu bag is placed over your mouth which is where they're putting the mask over your mouth and forcing air into your lungs or you get intubated you get put on a breathing tube um there are a lot of people who like i mentioned before might say okay well i do want cpr if my heart stops but i don't ever want to be put on a ventilator and for most people what that would actually look like in reality not on tv but in reality would be, I would get on your chest, I would break all of your ribs, we would do this for 15 minutes because you don't want to be intubated, and then we would stop and we would call time of death. So for most people, not everyone, but most, if we're just doing chest compressions and you don't want to be put on a ventilator, all we're doing is torturing you before you die, unfortunately. Uncomfortable laugh. <laughs> Yeah, I saw you see the way like, oh, okay. That's my cue that I need to stop. No, um, no, most... no, keep going. No, I am fine. I am fine. I'm just like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to life and death and dirt, bitches. We're talking about living and dying and growing yeah. things. Um, like growing community and growing gardens. So, okay. Again, asterisks on everything I say for most people. There are some people who have good outcomes from CPR. It's a very low percentage, but there are some people. So please, if you know somebody and you're screaming at your um, phone right now, my uncle, he had CPR and he did live. I'm happy to hear that. Um, that's very, very rare. Okay, In most cases, CPR is not successful. So I looked up the statistics for CPR um, success rates. Um, I also saw a study that said that they asked a bunch of people uh, how successful the average person thought CPR was. And the average person thought that CPR had a 75% success rate. And they based that guess off of what they saw 
on what, Bobby? Grey's on Anatomy? TV. Yes, on TV and movies. Because fortunately, most people have not seen actual CPR. And let's keep it that way when we can. Um, so yeah, the, the average person, when they did this study and they, they asked a bunch of people, thought that CPR had a 75% success rate, meaning that out of 10 people who needed CPR, uh, you know, like seven or eight of them yeah. would would live and be back to normal and carry on with their life. What do you think the actual statistics are? Do you have any guesses? 13%. What did you say? 13%. Bobby. Did I, I get it? Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I was thinking like one in eight. So yeah, yeah. roughly. You're very close. So for people who experience cardiac arrest, meaning their heart stops somewhere outside of the hospital, like you're out on a jog or you're at a barbecue or you're just at your house. And that's the majority of the majority of people who have cardiac arrest. It does happen outside of a hospital. So for those people, if they um, get what's called bystander CPR, meaning somebody's there and starts CPR and then calls the paramedics, uh, those people have about, uh, well, a 5 to 10% survival rate. So out of 100 people whose heart stops outside of the hospital, CPR gets started, they get taken to the hospital, out of a hundred people, about well, I think it's actually seven technically, seven people will survive. So 93 wow. will not survive. If you are already in the hospital and you experience cardiac arrest, which honestly, if your heart's gonna stop, that's the best place for it to stop. So if you're in a hospital where they have um medical professionals, ventilators, crash carts, defibrillators, that's the clear thing um you have a higher survival rate of 30 percent so for 100 people whose heart stops in the hospital 70 of them will still die even after cpr is attempted by trained medical professionals 30 percent will have what's considered successful cpr but let's talk about what that means Okay, because we're only talking about surviving. We're not talking about um, if you have like future issues down the road. Maybe you're still alive, but yeah. you have some other complications. I, I, I know someone who bears those or bore those scars. So, yeah. You do. Yeah. You, we talked about that before we started recording. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. But just remember so outside of hospital, if CPR is being performed, 7% survival rate. Inside of hospital, up to 30% survival rate. Initially, there was a study that I read. Now, this was just a study on one particular hospital, uh, but it was published in the National Library of Medicine. It's a real study. This is not from like hannaleeblogspot.com or something. This is a real study. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Okay. Um, and they found that in this particular hospital, there was about 300 people that they studied that had CPR in the hospital. There was a survival rate of 30% successful CPR at the time. What that means, successful CPR, means that they were able to get that person's heart to start beating on its own and we could stop chest compressions, okay? So 30% of the people, they were able, the medical professionals were able to get the heart to start beating again. But the people who were able to be discharged home oh, of that 30% was only 12%. Yeah, I believe that. Right. And what that means is that the other, what are we at? Oh, it's 100 minus 12. 88 <laughs> percent of people who had successful CPR yeah. still died in the hospital. Yeah. Okay. So uh, well, I imagine broken ribs and a broken sternum or whatever. 
smushing on the rest of your organs probably creates quite a bit of uh, internal damage, internal trauma, right? It does. Yeah, yeah it, it creates all kinds of internal yeah. trauma. You can, um, you can have rupture, you can rupture other organs, liver, spleen. But again, I mean, if you're doing what's considered effective chest compressions, that's a risk you have to take because you are right. literally trying to squeeze someone's heart between their spine and their sternum. Two bricks. It's yeah. brutal. It's brutal, unfortunately. And a lot of people don't know that because Meredith Gray did it one time with one hand and her patients all survived miraculously. So what's Patrick Dempsey's uh, survival rate? Right. I don't even know. Just I didn't watch the show. <laughs> I tried to watch the first season <laughs> and my friends were like, that. You can't watch this with us anymore because <laughs> I was just <laughs> everything that was so funny. right. Yeah, um, I can't stand those types of shifts. Yeah. So CPR, unfortunately, very low, very low survival rate. There are times when it is appropriate to attempt CPR. Like at this point in my life, a couple months ago, I might have told you something different. But at this point in my life, if my heart stopped, I would feel, yeah, it's appropriate. Go ahead and try. Give it a shot. Okay. Um, but as we age, our, um, our, the likelihood of us having a successful outcome from CPR goes down exponentially, exponentially. Um, and when we're past like age seventies, uh, eighties, oh yeah, we should, we really need to be thinking about CPR in an ethical way. Um, but that's hard to do when people have not been given the information about what CPR actually looks like for them to make an informed decision. I'm going to take a break and take a breath. Questions. What do you think? Well, wow. It's horrible, um, right? It, it's, uh, I knew it would be brutal. Um, I knew it was brutal. I, I know um, I did a lot of, I lived in like Montana in the wilderness kind of a thing. And it went to college in Colorado. So did a lot of wilderness uh, first aid stuff because when you get hurt out there, there's there's no, there weren't any cell phones either. So it was really, but um, yeah, we we never really thought, we were like, if we had to do CPR, there's not, don't, you know, I can't do that and, and drag your, you know, body down the hill. And, you know, so if there was just two of us, like, like, I could do CPR till I pass out. Like, but there's, you know, unless there's a third person to run and go and get help, get to help. Like, you know, that was kind of, we had accepted that was kind of a lost cause um, when you're hiking way out in the middle of nowhere. But, uh, I'm curious, I don't know if you'd plan to cover, but like AEDs, which are everywhere now, mm -hmm. and those types of devices, uh, I hope they improve people's chances of survival. You know, like if you go to a, if you go to most buildings now, there's a sign that says AED and like on the Navy base, we have them in every building. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, hopefully that is more effective than than CPR. But, that does make a difference. Yeah. You know. So AEDs can be actually very uh, helpful. And I mm -hmm. believe I don't have the statistics in front of me. I didn't think to look this one up. Um, mm -hmm. But I believe that they do increase likelihood of a better outcome if somebody experiences um, cardiac arrest. The, the key with any kind of cardiopulmonary resuscitation, meaning chest compressions or getting shocked um, the AED or the defibrillator, like you see on TV, um, is time. Like the yeah. sooner the chest compressions and the, um, life saving, saving measures, which includes getting shocked or other medications, like you mentioned, your mom got epinephrine, you know, there's other medications we can give people. The sooner we can get those things on board, the better, the more likely it is that that person will have a better outcome, even though in general, the outcomes just in general are, are, um, you know, yeah. low. Um, what's interesting about AEDs and defib defibrillators, the clear is that thanks to movies and TVs, everybody thinks that if somebody's flatlining, beep, their heart is not beating at all and has zero electrical activity. That's what the flatline means. 
that's what every movie shows. Oh, they shock the person and they're trying to electrocute the heart into starting to beat again. And that is wrong. And that will never, ever, ever work. That is fake. It's fake news. It's fake Hollywood. You do not defibrillate or shock flatline. If somebody's flatlined, you are chest compressing and you're yeah. giving all kinds of medications and hoping that their heart restarts on its own. It won't. Okay. Maybe one in a million. I don't know the actual statistics, but if somebody's truly flatlined, you know, call the family together. Um, so AEDs know AEDs, which is that little like portable computer device that has the pads on it that you stick on somebody's chest. Those pads are actually able to pick up the electrical activity of that person's heart. And so if a person is flatlined, it can read that that person has no electrical activity in the heart and it will not advise you to shock them. Because you know how a lot of times if you've been trained on an AED, it might say, shock, advised, stand clear, press button, okay? Um, but otherwise, if it is picking up that a person is flatlined, it will just say, begin chest compressions, and it guides you to just be trying to beat that person's heart. So flatline, we don't shock. Every single medical person you know, when they see that on a TV show, is going to say something. Just next time you're watching... A show with them. Yeah, I believe it. See what happens. Well, it, the point of it is to shock it into a northern normal rhythm, correct? Isn't okay. that what it is? Great question. No, I can see why people think uh. that because I used to think that before I learned about it. So this is really interesting, actually. When you are defibrillating somebody's heart, you're shocking them. You are trying to stop their heart. Okay. Because, hold on, <laughs> okay. So our heartbeat is um, initiated by this little electrical signal. It's called the SA node. We all have it. It's this little bundle of cells in our heart. And it mm -hmm. starts the electrical signal that then um, spreads out to all the cardiac muscle and makes it go and beat. Yeah. Okay. So if for some reason, somebody um, electrical activity of their heart is is misfiring and yeah. it's going like blah, 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 like the electricity is all over the place and the heart's just jiggling or doing something else we take this defibrillator and we go and we are trying to stop that electrical activity for a moment in the hopes that the little sa node will then spontaneously start beating in what we're hoping is um a non-fatal uh heartbeat so it's the opposite when we're shocking someone we're actually purposefully trying to stop the heart for a moment in the hopes that it will, will yeah. restart okay. yeah yeah but the movies and the tv will have you believe that you're shocking the heart in order to jump start it like you would a car uh, yeah right and what do we know about movies and tv they they lie. can always trust them <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right Right. Okay. So, that's a, that was a like, great question. What are your thoughts on that? So, um, that's crazy. I, I, I guess I, I sort of understand, I understand the, the AED and the whole thing. Um, you know, I worry about, uh, people, you know, they're everywhere, but most people don't have training. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm If I'm somewhere, I'm going to try and help them. Like I can't, I couldn't watch like somebody I know or just a normal, just a random person on, you know, like, oh, there's an AED. They just passed out, you know, like, but I mean, we, I, as part of my job, we all get uh, CPR and stuff training, but like, I can't imagine not having been exposed to them to just walk up and be like, oh, what do I do? Let me read the manual. Let me read the instructions oh. and like, you know, meanwhile, time's ticking away. So I'm going to be more inclined, I guess, to try CPR. But, you know, I'm a big person and uh, yeah, I'm going to crush your ribs if I put my weight on your chest. Yeah, That's effective so. CPR. I mean, that's effective chest compressions. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that's terrifying because, you know, I, I wouldn't want to hurt somebody also. But so I guess, but that's what you're supposed to do. Right. That is what you're supposed to do. Yep. Yeah. And the bottom line, forgive me for, this is going to sound really crass, but that person is already dead. You're not, oh, I, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you, you, if your heart has stopped, you're, you are not alive. Maybe you have some brain activity, but um, in general, the consensus across the board is if you are somewhere and somebody collapses and we think we might have a CPR situation on hand, start CPR, try. Yeah, start CPR or stick the AED on them. Um, where we get into, um, you know, the, the places where it's really important for us to be mindful of somebody's wishes, like if they have a DNR, is more in a medical setting or yeah. if EMS or paramedics are called to the scene. But if you're a bystander and somebody goes down, um, there's something called implied consent, which means unless you know otherwise, go ahead and, and try, um, yeah. you know, if you feel like you can or if you feel like you want to. Um, yeah. I feel like you have to. Like, but that's my personal belief, like to help people. And I couldn't just be like, oh, they're having a bad day and just walk. <laughs> like uh -huh. I, I would feel compelled to help them. But now I know other people are like, I'm not going to get, mad. you know, yeah. I'm not um, uh, on a different topic. My oldest daughter is type one diabetic and the school uh, glucagon. You know, yeah. glucagon, it's mm -hmm. like a shot that's administered to kind of give a surge of, of, I guess, insulin, like uh, sure. glucose, glucose to re yeah. you know, to help somebody in uh, who's in dire straits with a low blood sugar. But the school district here was like, we're, we don't want to, you know, we're not going to administer this because we're accepting responsibility if something happens. And I, I fought with the local school district and we fixed their policy, but like, yeah. they were like, Oh, I'm like, well, I bring you this thing and it's supposed to stay in the classroom with my 10 year old daughter at the time, you know? And they're like, Oh, but we, we couldn't, you know, that would like, we can't accept that risk. I'm like, uh, no, the risk is if you don't try and help the kid yeah. or don't try someone, in my opinion. But um, yeah, it's it's crazy that people could just, you know, just traipse on by. I would be I'd be even more traumatized if I didn't try and help them, if I helped them or tried and was unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. So it's um, yeah, it's a it's a scary it's a scary thought like. Maybe I need a tattoo DNR, like right, right here. <laughs> Some people do that. That's what their character workers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Do. They feel really, really strongly about that. Um, um, yeah, yeah. And it even can be, so like what you're talking about is a very human, well, for those of us who have the capacity to feel empathy, that's a very human response. Like, I feel like I have to do something. Yeah. And even for those of us who work in the medical field, um, it can be really difficult sometimes, even if I know that a person is a DNR, to not intervene, even though I know that's what their wishes are. It still can be difficult to just say, uh -huh. okay, we have to just hands off. Um, uh, so yeah, that's a very human, normal um, emotion for a lot of us. Some people might might not feel that same way, but yeah, I think that's pretty um, understandable that you feel like, no, I have to, I have to try something. Yeah, I, it's... Uh... Um, yeah, but then there is the long-term impact, right? So I mentioned we have a family friend. Uh, he had been jogging, had a cardiac event, um, and uh, he passed out. And the next person to come along was a nurse, and she started doing chest compressions. So I don't know what the gap was, but um, he was he was down for quite a while. She did the chest compressions for well over 15 minutes, I know. And uh, the ambulance showed up and, and they got him. But it, the long-term effect was early onset dementia, Alzheimer's. Like, it like kicked everything into overdrive. Um, which I, I imagine that that was still going to happen probably, but I feel like it accelerated it because he went, he went screaming downhill from that point. 
Um, but so, you know, and uh, I do remember him. Uh, he he was in his more lucid moments. He he regretted that, you know, he was still still with us. Still and, with us. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. And, um, so but he was also a doctor. Um, and uh, yeah. so he knew what was coming. And um, but uh, yeah, it's it's tragic. And then, you know, and uh, to save someone and then have that happen, that would be heartbreaking for me, you know, to, or to watch, like, you know, you saved my life, but what did you say? You know, what mm -hmm. kind of a life is it? So that's a, that's also a very difficult um, thing to, to think about. That is, and that is um, unfortunately not uncommon and I'm sorry, I have to plug my computer in. Hold on. Right in the middle of this intense thought that you just had. By <clears throat> so sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> this would be a good time. There. Good time to insert commercial. I right, um For all your sponsors. Oh, yeah. All of our sponsors. <laughs> definitely not NBC or whatever fucking network Grey's Anatomy was on. <laughs> um, right. So, okay, so that story that you that you just told about a person that you know who had CPR in the field, meaning outside of the hospital, yeah. and they did survive, but had some significant long-term effects after it. So uh, that is a real thing. So first of all, we have to look at how many people will even survive CPR at all, right. okay? And then from there, what does it mean to survive CPR? So it's very common unfortunately for somebody who does survive cpr to have significant neurological effects afterward because our the number one thing that our cells cannot go without the number one thing that will kill our cells is a lack of oxygen that's the first thing that will kill us also glucose sugar um, water and other electrolytes but the first thing that will kill us is lack of oxygen and when the heart stops beating, your brains, I mean, everything in your body, but the big one is your brain. Your brain cells immediately start going without oxygen. So when I jump on somebody's chest and I'm trying to beat their heart from the outside, <clears throat> what ultimately I'm trying to do is make their blood circulate with each compression. I'm pushing, pushing, pushing that blood yeah. through their, their circulatory system, hopefully in order to try desperately to get oxygen to their vital organs, their brain being number one. But unfortunately, that's extremely hard to do from the outside. So our brain cells, after just minutes of lack of oxygen, start dying. Yeah. So if enough of our brain cells die, then we can have significant neurological effects, including, like you said, um, dementia, cognitive changes, uh, personality changes. There's a whole, there's a whole spectrum of neurological deficit that people can have, even if they technically survived the CPR. Um, and it's interesting that you said that this particular person, when he had lucid moments, was able to express, I really wish I wasn't here. <clears throat> the study, I can't remember where I saw it, but it was one of the studies I was looking at when I was researching for this um, for the statistics okay. and it particularly had a section that talked about that i can't remember what the statistics were but it said of the people who did survive cpr this percentage of them wish that they hadn't which is yeah. just like oh and how morally distressing like you said for not only that person but the people who performed cpr because you're just doing what you think you're supposed to be doing it is yeah. traumatizing to perform CPR and then to have the outcome be maybe not what that person was happy with or at the time um, is really, that's intense. It's very morally distressing for a lot of people, unfortunately. So yeah. it's not like on Grey's Anatomy, period. Yeah. I mean, this is like, this is significant things that we're talking about. Um, there was the football player, Damar Hamlin on the Buffalo Bills, who a lot of us witnessed this person, this young man getting CPR. 
um, on a football field. And he actually had a very good outcome from his CPR. And that is probably one of the only people that we are going to witness have a really good outcome from CPR. He's young. What was he in his 20s? Yeah. Okay. He had immediate CPR by trained professionals. So I know he was getting real chest compressions immediately. He was probably put on ice immediately, which also increases your chances of having a good outcome. Like, literally cooling the body i'm not going to get too into that but just know the colder you are the better the outcome in general like if you want to you know generalize um and that he was probably immediately intubated immediately in the hospital so he had ev everything going for him as far as the best case scenario if your heart's going to stop and he did survive and that's great but for as most of us that would not be the case as an athlete, he probably has a larger than normal heart too, which moves a bigger volume of blood per per maybe. squeeze. Yeah, maybe, or his physical condition was like a lot, yeah. Yeah, a lot stronger and healthier than than a lot of us. So that's but, that was a very intense emotional thing for a lot of people to see and and traumatic for them to see. He also had a good outcome, which is great, but I fear that that's going to skew the public opinion about like, yeah, CPR is just like on TV. It works. You know, you get it. Right. Done you're back yeah. That's when that. Most of the time, that's not the case. Glad he made it. But maybe the lesson was, uh, was obscured in there. I, I feel like they should probably discuss. It's been a little bit uh, since I had our CPR class, but I feel like they should spend more time discussing maybe Maybe the ethics of, of CPR or the or the long term realities, you know, like, you know, because it would break my heart, you know, hey, I take this class every two years kind of a thing. I've been trained. I know what I'm supposed to do. And I did it all. And the person died or I wasn't able, especially if you see, hey, they did on the football player, you know, Grey's Anatomy or ER or whatever the hell TV show, uh, you know people may have a false expectation of their ability to to save the day which would be you know emotionally destroying for me like not to be able to help somebody but yeah. i have a much more accurate picture now of it um, i'm sorry that you do but i think it's important no, that you it's do. okay i know <laughs> I, i'm all about understanding the realities of things that's a um you know i would rather know than uh have some uh incorrect thought or incorrect expectation but now i did have a question so i know that it's exhausting right because when we did cpr class it's like we would trade off or you know mm -hmm. nobody's going to be doing it for an hour right you're going to be oh. Oh. you're going to be wrecked Not so yeah and then but like if if it's me big person and then some little person who takes over maybe they're not like is there anything to the consistency of the cpr yeah. and I, I um like so we talked a little uh just a week right after you asked me about this i was exposed to a uh, lucas device um an organization i belong to contributes to a rescue organization and uh, they had used some of the money we've donated to them to purchase. It's called a Lucas device. It's like, it's like twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, and look, but it's, what it's is a Lucas device. It's Explain. a battery operated. It's a little like flat with kind of a D shape, and there's a little plunger thing, and they put it on people, and it it does the thing. Um, chest compressions. Yeah, it's yeah, basically it it. a device that does chest compressions um, on a person when CPR is in progress. Oh, Bobby, you froze. Oh. There you are. Um, okay. Yeah, so the Lucas device stands for Lund University Cardiopulmonary Assist System. But it is basically a device that does chest compressions on a person so that they're consistent and the correct rate. Because humans, um, as Bob, oh, Bobby, you froze again. Um, I know. Oh, you're back. As Bobby mentioned, 
humans, we get tired, we're inconsistent, um, we have different levels of strength. And so our chest compressions, when we're swapping out who's doing the chest compressions, um, can be very inconsistent. And you're supposed to ideally swap out every two minutes because it is so physically taxing to do effective chest compressions. So the Lucas device is a machine that can do it for us. And Bobby, are you still there? I'm here, but I'm frozen. Like okay, my video. Can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So tell um, us more about what happened with this Lucas device. You helped somebody get one. Oh, there we go. So, um, yeah, it's a rescue organization in Eastern Tennessee that um, I participate. It's a car event called Wookiees in the Woods. We raise money um, every year through raffle and stuff and donate to a bunch of different charities, uh, St. Jude's uh, and um, the Blunt County Rescue Squad. Uh, so they operate in the wilderness. They're at a place called the Tale of the Dragon, Deals Gap. Um, it's a It's a very curvy road car and motorcyclists come from all over the world to go drive there but it's 318 turns and 11 miles and um it uh there are a lot of accidents and some of them are fatal and uh there's no the nearest hospital is like uh it's like 45 minutes away so um we our organization has contributed a bunch of money over the years to them and uh, they purchased this device and they were demonstrating it to us because they were saying thank you. Like look what we bought with the money you gave us last year. And um, so, but I guess the whole point is to to put it on and uh, I did look it up and somebody survived for like an hour, um, like with that, with the battery operated machine, just giving them compressions. And, but I think, you and I, they were cold because hypothermia was involved. So, um, but, you know, I'm, we're happy to help, but like stuff like that's amazing. And as a roboticist, you know, I love that we can create a machine that can assist people and, and take over. And uh, I think probably the consistency of the compressions is probably, but I imagine it's very powerful, uh, you know, if you put it on me, it's going to have to, it's going to, you know, versus some, a little tiny person, it, it's probably, I wonder if it, if it can sense how hard it needs to push, but. That's an interesting thought. I bet it does. Yeah. yeah. I bet it has some kind of ability to sense if it's doing effective <clears throat> compressions. Yeah. On person, like regardless of size or stature. Um, but it's nice that we have those things and maybe there'll be like AEDs eventually and, and we'll have them in random buildings and, you know, people, Oh, well then they won't necessarily need to do it or do it ineffectively. I think it's probably the biggest issue with, with CPR is, you know, cause I, I really don't feel like they told us to break ribs like when I took the class, like if you ain't breaking ribs, you aren't doing anything kind of a thing, you know? Yeah. They did make the point. It's very difficult to smush between two very, like the, the rib cages that it's very strong, right? It's designed to prevent being crushed and you're, you're intentionally trying to crush it. So, yeah. That's the bottom line, right. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah. They won't tell you because it is kind of horrific to talk about and uncomfortable. Um, so they won't necessarily tell you that in, if you've ever taken CPR training, what they'll tell you is you need to compress the chest to a depth of two inches. That's what they're going to tell you. Um, so that's how far you need that's to push that first yeah. sternum down at least uh, two inches. But you're right when you, when you say um, that you imagine that the chest compression consistency is a huge factor. It is, it is the chest <laughs> compressions. Like I said, early effective chest compressions. And then on top of that, like AEDs, defibrillators and, you know, resuscitation <clears throat> medications are what, uh, can increase a person's, uh, I can't think of the word, not risk. Survivability. Survivability. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, that's why you had mentioned way early on in the episode that you've taken CPR classes for your whole life. And it seems like they keep changing it and like, okay, yeah. do rescue breaths and do five compressions to one rescue breath. Now do 20 compressions to one rescue breath. 
And they do change it as we learn more and more about what's effective. And ultimately what we're finding is most effective for bystander CPR is just chest compressions. Just yeah. get the blood to the brain cells. Like that's, that's the bottom line. Um, and you're, yeah, like you're essentially, you're trying to beat that person's heart from the outside of their body well enough that it is actually pushing their blood through their body. Like you're trying to be their blood pressure for them, which is hard to do and exhausting and people tire out quickly. Um, yeah. So that's where a Lucas machine could be very helpful and consistent. So congratulations on your successful fundraiser. I mean, that's, wow, yeah. how much was it you said? How much did that? Uh, $69,420. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> yeah. So that's um, how much you, you raised for the fundraiser. Yeah, that's how much we raised. Oh, We're a wonderful. bunch of children. So. Yeah. <laughs> Don't change. Don't change. So, um, but yeah, um, so it's, it's pretty amazing that, that we can save people and that we do have devices and that we do have people who are trained, yeah. um, but I, I understand the effectiveness and the, the realities. Yeah. Um, so the bottom line is there are times when trying CPR is very appropriate and well, actually, the bottom line is every single person has the right to choose for themselves. Yeah, go ahead and try CPR on me or no, I don't want CPR. Um, and there are situations where we might not know what a person's choice is. But in general, we have the right to make choices about that for ourselves. Um, then the second bottom line is it's, um, you know, in a lot of cases for bystander CPR, it is appropriate to at least try if, if you don't yeah. know otherwise. There is one more thing before we wrap up here um, that I wanted to kind of go over quickly is what's called a pulsed form. This is what the pulsed form looks like in New York state. It's like bright pink mm. and it stands for physician's order for life-sustaining treatment. And this is like a um, pretty complex DNR order. So um, if you're interested, you can look up Pulsed, P-O-L-S-T, for whatever state you live in, and it might bring up something that looks similar to this. I know you can't read it from here, but it, this is, um, if we feel like somebody is at a point in their life where we want them or we're encouraging them to make choices about, yes, I want CPR or no, I don't, this is a form that kind of guides you through making those choices. And so on this one in particular for New York State, it has a section, you would fill out your personal information if you're the one making the, the decisions, like this is your pulse form. And the first question it asks you, it says, check one, do you want CPR or do you wanna be a DNR? Which means if your heart stops, do you want us to jump on your chest and start compressions? Or do you want us to not perform chest compressions? <clears throat> People can make that choice and again, you can always change your mind. This is a living document. You're allowed to change your mind. But then when you open it up, it goes into some more nuanced questions like, um, if you stop breathing, would you want to be intubated? Breathing tube? Uh, the choices are, no, I do not want to be intubated. Don't put a breathing tube down. Or some people might choose a trial period, meaning you can intubate me, don't keep me on the ventilator for months and months. Okay. Right. Um, and then some people say, um, yes, intubate me and keep me on the ventilator as long as possible. Okay. So that's a choice people can make. But then there's some other interesting choices that sometimes we don't think about, like treatment guidelines. That's what mine says, at least for New York State. Yeah. So the choices are, I want comfort measures only, which means please do not try to extend my life. Just keep me comfortable. This is a lot of the people that I work with in hospice. Yeah. Not everyone does, but a lot of them do. Another choice is limited medical interventions, which means mm, maybe there's some life-sustaining treatments I would want, but maybe not others case by case. And then there's a choice that says no limitations on medical interventions. I want you to put every tube into me, every monitor on me, every machine hook me up to like try everything. Okay. So people can choose what they want there. 
Um, artificially administered food and nutrition. So this is asking about feeding tubes because people have the right to make choices about, okay, if for some reason I can't eat enough to sustain my body, do I want you to just let it be? You can choose that. That's fine choice for some people. Um, some people say, uh, no, I actually would prefer put a feeding tube in and artificially give me nutrition through that or a trial period. Um, and then the last question it asks on ours is about antibiotic use. And a lot of people don't think about this because oh. you think like, oh, if you're sick, you just take antibiotics. Like that's, why would I even question that? But sometimes if you have somebody who's very, very ill, like the people I care for, or has very significant dementia, Sometimes they might say, actually, you know what? If I get an infection, just keep me comfortable and let me die of the infection. And that's yeah. a very horrifying thought for a lot of people. But an infection is one of the ways that we as humans leave this life. Like that's yeah. sometimes we get an infection and that's what causes our death. And we can keep people very comfortable even when they have an infection if that's something that they've chosen that they would prefer. Um, the other options though are uh, case by case, maybe I would want antibiotics, maybe I wouldn't. And then the third option is yes, please use antibiotics. And if I have an infection, try to try to fight it. So it's really interesting because a lot of people know about what a DNR is, but don't think about some of those other nuanced questions <clears throat> that, are, that are on this particular pulse. Um, so that's something you can take a look at for yourself or maybe somebody in your life that, that, um, no. that's P O L S T P O L S T Holst. Okay. And that stands for physicians order for life sustaining treatment. Oh, that's the other thing. So this form, um, you can look it up online and probably get a copy for wh whichever state you live in, but it's not a legal document or order until your doctor has signed it because ideally your doctor goes over this with you tells you kind of some of the things i just talked about and then you make your informed decision and then they sign that they went over it with you once it's signed by a physician or a pa or nurse practitioner i think in most states um then it is considered a legal document and what's interesting about these is that most people are told to put this on their refrigerator and the reason they are is because EMS are trained to look for these on someone's refrigerator because that's a consistent place in most people's homes. That's also why this is bright pink uh -huh. is so that it gets their attention. So that if for some reason EMS is called to a home, they can peek at this to find out what somebody's wishes were. That's a post form. Wow. I think I'll be getting a hold of one. So. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. Even if you're like, I'm nowhere near like give me CPR, give me everything. I don't feel like I need to fill anything like this out. Give me all the bells and whistles if if my heart stops. But I think it's a good idea to take a look at one and just find out what are the different options that you can make choices about for the future. Um, or like I said, for somebody that you know. You know, some of us might be somebody's healthcare proxy. And so what that means is if, which I'm gonna do coming up, we're gonna do a healthcare proxy episode. Uh, but what that means is that there might be a time where you would have to make these decisions on someone's behalf. Yeah. So it's good to know about and, and have conversations about um, so you know what that person's wishes would be. Yeah, I know my mom ha doesn't want to be resuscitated, so yeah. yeah. Okay, and that's yeah. good that you know that, even though that's like yeah. hard to hear. Oh, I know, yeah. Um, but it's helpful that, yeah. that that has been clear, made clear to you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'll definitely, I'm going to look into that. I know that uh, at least at the University of Florida Health stuff, Shans, it's their big hospital there. They, um, when I had an appointment there, they were like, do you have a living will? Mm -hmm. And I was like, um, why do you ask? And they're like, well, if you don't, we will help you fill one out today if you would like, like, because mm -hmm. they want um, all of their patients they want that associated with their medical record, which I was like, wow. I'm like, I do have one. And so, and they're like, oh, okay. Most, a lot of people, I was younger at the time, don't have that. But um, 
like, yep. Just so happened I was doing a regular will. And they were like, do you want to do this? Sure. Let's do that too. So good. But. I'm glad that you do have that. And I'm glad that they brought it up. Um, yes, I'm planning on doing a whole episode about healthcare proxies, living wills. Right. Um, those kind of, even though that sounds kind of boring, I think it's really important information. Anybody over the age of 18 should have a healthcare proxy and, uh, at least a healthcare proxy. And it's very easy to do. So I'll do a whole episode about, uh, filling out a healthcare proxy, um, at the very least, but yeah, that's, that's really, it's helpful to, um, think about what your wishes are and then document those wishes that's the bottom line is it has to be documented somewhere so yeah. in a post form or in a living will we just walk around with that like pinned you know <laughs> or dmr <laughs> tattoo yeah i mean like we've right, got to yeah. document it somehow um yeah but that's really valuable information like i didn't realize that there was that form like that that i could put on the refrigerator and uh um, yeah yeah. Um, so the Pulse form, P-O-L-S-T, you can look it up for, I'm sure you can just Google Pulse California or Pulse Florida and, and find yeah. um, your state's Pulse forms, at least just to take a look at them. Uh, another question that somebody had asked me was, does it have to be this this hot pink or can I make a copy of it? A photocopy is fine as long as it's been signed by a doctor. It's not a, It's not a binding document until a doctor has signed it or a PA or a nurse practitioner, um, the reason they're hot pink is just to catch the attention of uh, EMS providers. I worked with a client who was actually um, on hospice services, had one of these and was very clear, I don't want CPR, I don't want DNR, or uh, don't want to be intubated, all those things. And um, he was a house unhoused person, but he was living at a hotel, like through a community um, program to house people. And he, and he didn't have a refrigerator st to stick this on. So he got a really pretty picture frame and placed it on his um, dresser in his hotel room, which is where he lived, which I thought was such a good idea. Like I loved that idea. Yeah. He made sure that it was somewhere where people could see and he got a picture frame so it could be propped up on his, uh, on his uh, dresser in the hotel room. So refrigerators is where they tell you to put it, but that's just like the consistent place yeah. that we're trained to look for it but it doesn't have to be in the fridge. Well, <laughs> you're doing the good work with this, uh, with this podcast. Like, I'm sweating. Like this, this is intense, but uh, it, thank you for saying that. Um, it's very intense and unfortunate to have to tell the real truth, but I feel strongly that it's important for people to, to know um the real information no, you need to know through, you need yeah, to know. Through from decision um because the tv and the movies are going to have us making all kinds of uninformed decisions which is just a, a disservice um well, yeah. to us as individuals you know as sentient beings who have the right to make choices about ourselves final yeah. thoughts bobby <laughs> wow this was a lot but it was important and i did learn stuff so um okay. and uh yeah, I do recommend people get first aid training of some sort. Like if you, you never know, um, you, you may help somebody you care about. So not necessarily CPR, but like all the other stuff, bleeding, those types of things. So that that's, that's something I care about is like, um, so being able to help somebody in a crisis situation. So. And it sounds like you do. Yeah. You have a history of working a lot with like wilderness. Uh, yeah. yeah. Wilderness. And growing up in Florida around like sailboats and stuff, like as kids, they were, it was always like first aid training and stuff because, you know, you never know when you might need it. Somebody might cut themselves or whatever, yeah. break a bone. And uh, so, I don't know. I feel like that used to be much more of a focus, like for kids in elementary school and stuff middle school um my my daughters didn't have the the stuff like we did when i was a kid but um they didn't have to swim a mile and and drag somebody and give them that was crazy that was the great that That's was so because crazy. my instructor was a was a navy dive instructor before that he was a nut yeah but um yeah <laughs> but uh yeah that was a weird that's a little weird tidbit but um 
but I've dove many, like, well over a thousand dives and never had an accident, never had. So he taught us well. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, maybe there was something to, to this, this person <laughs> that was having you do all that. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, if you teach kids firmly, I think sometimes, you know, you teach them that to access, then um, not saying you have to abuse them or anything, but like if you teach them, this is important and this is what you need to do, then I feel like we're more equipped later to handle crisis. Yeah. So, but, but I can never do so what much. you do. Thank oh, you. Well, thanks for saying that. And what I, you know, what I always respond when people say that is, um, I appreciate that. And I could never, ever be a school teacher period. Yeah. Like I, you know, it just takes all kinds. Like there's certain people that are yeah. meant to be in certain roles, um, all of which are valuable except for billionaires. And I appreciate <laughs> I you saying that. that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do. I hope that this was helpful information. I'm sorry if you're traumatized. I understand. No, I'm, okay. I'm okay. Yeah. And anybody I'll listening. Cry later. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's okay to get emotional. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is a, it is emotional. Um, and, and intense and it can be very triggering, but I hope that the information was helpful and oh, was. good. And I will say, and, um, signing off is that I'm planning on doing some more episodes, one about healthcare proxy and living will, um, got a couple other episodes planned, but if there's people who have ideas or something that they would like to know more about, um, please reach out and let me know. I'm at, uh, Oh my gosh. What is my Instagram for the podcast? <laughs> I took five months off. I don't remember. Hold on. Bobby, why don't you plug yourself while I'm looking this up? Where can we find so, you? Um, my Instagram is mainly my online footprint. Uh, it's at freaky tiki, F R E E K I T I K I. Um, I post my art, but I don't post that much anymore, but, um, but, uh, yeah, my artwork and some other stuff is there. Uh, at Tiki. I love it. Thank you. Um, if you have comments, only if they're nice or suggestions for future episodes, you can reach out to me at uh, on Instagram at life underscore death underscore dirt. And um, I would love to hear if there's other, yeah, if there's other topics people are interested in learning about. Um, and finally, my last thing I'll say about Grey's Anatomy is... <laughs> There is an episode where Izzy, the doctor Izzy, does what's called a precordial thump on a patient. And it is, we used to do these. We don't do them anymore because we found they're not that effective. But you used to be trained if you took um, advanced CPR, like medical personnel CPR, you used to be trained that you could try doing a precordial thump on somebody if their heart stops before we start chest compressions and that's where you take your fist and you go wham and you yeah. hit their chest so hard that you're literally trying to defibrillate them with the energy from your fist and on Grey's Anatomy Izzy did it and she went and the person came to life okay that's fake I did a precordial thump one time in my career it did not work Okay, like they, it doesn't, they don't work. And Grey's Anatomy is fake. And her little punk ass precordial thump, like, eh. and then the person suddenly came to life was my final straw. That was my last reason. Um, so please stop watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're just trying to pre break the ribs. <laughs> probably. I mean, if you're going to do one that was effective, you probably would break ribs. Like, yeah, I just remember seeing her do that. And I was like, no. No, this is this is it. I can't. <laughs> like it's the final straw. Um, so folks, hang in there. It's always worth learning about CPR. It's always worth learning about first aid. But if it doesn't work, if you ever have to do it and it's not successful, please know that it's usually unsuccessful for the medical professionals as well. It's not your fault. The end. You okay, Bobby? I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks for thanks hanging so out much. with us, folks. Um, we'll be around 
reach out and otherwise have a good one. Stay safe. Bye. Bye-bye.